Thank you. Thank you, Handbell Choir. See, y'all got to stay on your toes because you never know there's going to be a Sunday where we start on time. And everybody had to come on in. Gus is laughing. I don't know about y'all, but we, we started on time today. That's awesome. Okay, the announcements I have for today is if you have a prayer request, remember to um, hand that to the ushers during the singing of the first hymn. And this Thursday, and I should be on your calendar, yes, um, the Thursday's child is having a program called Thankful for Music and Each Other. And this is their Thanksgiving program, I'm assuming, because it says thankful in it. But we're all invited. We are all invited. So, and, and they're going to serve supper after the program. So if you know you're going to come, which you're invited, call the church office so we can have enough food or tell Lula Ann or somebody that, because um, they want to make sure and have enough food. We are getting ready for the Advent Christmas season, and we're taking orders for our poinsettias. So um, there was an order form in last Sunday's bulletin. There's a number of them over by the office, right? Oh, she's not in there. There's some in the office, by the office, so you can um, sign up there. And you need to place your orders hopefully by next Sunday because we're going to have them in worship on December 1st. And next Sunday, which is Christ the King Sunday, but at 4 p.m., we're going to gather here in the sanctuary to decorate for the Advent Christmas season. Of course, the more we have, the faster the work is done. The Anson Singers Christmas concert is Sunday, December 1st at 5 p.m. At 5 p.m. It's going to be at 5 p.m. That's the Sunday of Thanksgiving, and we had some of our members that are going to be out of town and coming back in that Sunday. So instead of us having a Saturday practice, we're going to practice some that Sunday. So the, the concert's at 5 p.m. So share that with people. That's the Sunday right after Thanksgiving, two weeks from today. And we're collecting toys for tots bring a new toy to be shared with a child in our community that is in need and I'll be placing the boxes in the narthex and downstairs across from the children's choir room. I'm going to place those this week. So those are the announcements I have for this morning. A lot of them it's that season, that time of the year where we have a good number of announcements. And if you didn't have a chance to turn in your pledge card, you can put it in the offering plate or, or drop it by the office anytime soon. So let us now um, have our call to worship. Please stand. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Worship God with shouts of joy. Worship God with songs of gladness. Worship God with hopes of love. Sing praise to God. Sing praises. Worship God
please remain standing for our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed, found on page 881 of your hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Our Psalter is found on page 839, it's Psalm 118, and we will be singing the response. The Lord is my strength and my power. The Lord has become my salvation. There are joyous songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me but has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God who has given us light. Leading the festival procession of praise up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, who is good, for God's steadfast love endures forever.
you. You may be seated. Our epistle lesson is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 13. It can be found in your pew Bible on page 1033. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is living in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to Im imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you. We did not eat anyone's bread without paying, but with toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not burden any of you. It was not because we have not that right, but to give you in our conduct an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this command. If anyone will not work, let him not eat. For we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work in quietness and to earn their own living. Brethren, do not be weary in well-doing. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will the children please come down at this time? Oh, he decided he couldn't walk the whole way. Well, he's doing pretty good. Okay, I got a question to ask you. Probably Madeline Tyson might answer this. I'm not sure Brian's, Bryson oh, is there yet. But have you ever volunteered for a job at home to help your family? You have chores? Sometimes. What kind of things do you have to do? Make up your bed. Yeah, I remember that one. Get yourselves ready. Do you do other things to help out around the house? Any? Oh, okay. You don't, what, what about, um, do you ever have to like wash the dishes or load the dishwasher or anything? You're not there yet, are you? Okay, wait, it'll happen. Oh, okay, you got to listen to your music and plan for that. Right, that's good. What about clearing the table after supper? Do you help with that yet? I'm giving them some ideas, Carrie. What about helping in the yard? Oh, gosh, y'all, it's going to come. Though I never did any yard work either when I was growing up. My brother had to do all that. He had to put out the garbage, too. I didn't ever have to do that. So just telling you, remember those things. But I had to help with the dishwasher. And we, had, we had a dishwasher back in my day. Not many people had them then, but I had to unload it and put away dishes, the ones I could reach, you know. Anyway, I'm talking about work. And... and it may not be your job yet, and you may take on more responsibility as you get other get there. But what you do, making your bed, getting yourself ready, it's not really a job, is it? It's just something you signed up for. Something. It's not something you signed up for. It's something you do because that's what you need to do, right? Try to keep your room a little bit neat. Put away your toys and stuff. Well, the reason I'm talking about that is... I want to talk about what our job is as people who follow Jesus. What's our job as people who follow Jesus? What are we supposed to do? What? Praise God. Yeah, come to worship. Sing to God. Praise God wherever we are, remembering God. Excellent, excellent. What's something else we do? 
We pray. We pray for people. We pray. We thank God for the many blessings we have. What about um, sharing with other people? Playing fairly when you, when you play with others? Coming to Sunday school? A lot of those things. What if some of your friends at school, like you had a new kid at school, but some of your friends wouldn't welcome that child to their table at lunch? Does stuff like that happen at school sometimes? People are sort of, you have assigned seats, that takes care of that, you don't. So you might look around to see if somebody's by themselves and see if they need some, a friend with them at a table, you never know. I think as Christians, as followers of Jesus, it's our job to be friendly, don't you think? Friendly, kind to people, help other people out. You know, not to put our lives in danger, but to be helping others. A lot of times we're like, oh, I wouldn't have to do this if I was a Christian. Have you ever thought about that? No, of course you didn't think about that. But we try to do the best thing. We try to care about other people. We try not to say anything ugly about people. It's a big deal. We've got a big job as followers of Jesus to do the right thing and to help other people know that, you know, it's a lot we signed up for when we said we were going to follow Jesus. And it's not always easy. Sometimes it's hard. Jesus said, when you do it for the least of these, you do it unto me. So when we're helping other people and friendly to other people, we're being friendly to Jesus because we're helping other people, and that's what he's asked us to do. So I don't want you to think of being a Christian as a job, but we do have things that we do because we signed up to be followers of Jesus Christ. Oh, this man wants to run around. Let's pray. Dear God, please help us to never be tired of doing good. Help these children grow in their faith and help us as adults to lead them in that direction. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I had one prayer request that I want to share this morning. Um, we're to continue to keep David Tamur in our prayers. He's had some abnormal labs when he's gone to Duke at the doctor, so they're trying to figure out what's going on. So just keep that family in your prayers and David in your prayers for that. Also, Lonnie's still in Chapel Hill, but I'm thinking he might come home soon, right, Anna? Okay, I didn't hear you, but that's okay. Tuesday. Tuesday. That's what he told me last week, that he might come home Tuesday. So let's keep praying for that, right? Let's keep praying, and because um, I know he's ready to come back home, I think. I don't know. He's getting spoiled rotten by, by your children. <laughs> Those girls are taking him everywhere. We want to keep Fred Ross in our prayers and Chuck Kaiser. And Corinne texted me this morning, um, Lucy has a little bit of a cough, so didn't want to bring her out in this weather, but she did tell me that John is moving in the right direction. So after a couple of years of struggling with his ankle and mending, um, she thinks things are looking positive. So that's wonderful, and it's always good to hear some praise and good news. So we want to continue to pray for all those on our prayer list and also the anonymous prayers that are out there that people have shared with me. Let us go to God in prayer at this time.
Dear God, we confess to each other and to you, our creator, that we fall short of being what we have been created to be, what we have committed ourselves to be, disciples of the kingdom. Often we seek out the easiest path, the paths of least involvement in places where we might be uncomfortable, or even paths of self-centeredness. Dear God, forgive us for getting so caught up in the world's trappings and its false messages of hope that we lose sight of the hope of the kingdom, the hope of the kingdom which brings healing and peace to a world in turmoil. Oh Lord, please hear us, forgive us, and renew our resolve to build the kingdom of peace. In this time that we worship together, we resolve, dear Lord, to become more kingdom-minded, to be your peacemakers here and now. We pray all this in the names we have mentioned out loud and on our hearts, in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, the one who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to ask the ushers to come forward at this time to receive our morning offering. Let us pray. God of visions and dreams, as we seek to make a difference in our world, teach us anew that your love makes all things possible. Work within our offerings this day that they may be signs of our commitment to dream your dreams and to bring your vision for our world to life. Work within these gifts that those who have lost hope for a better future may find all they need to live with passion and purpose. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
I'm going to let you sit down because this passage is a little bit long. Our gospel passage is from the gospel according to Luke, chapter 21, 5 through 19. And as some spoke of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings, he said, As for these things which you see, the days will come when there shall not be left here one stone upon another that will be thrown down. And they asked him, Teacher, when will this be? And what will be the sign when this is about to take place? And he said, Take heed that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is at hand. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified, for this must first take place, but the end will not be at once. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and pestilences. And there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. And you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be a time for you to bear testimony. Settle it therefore in your minds not to meditate beforehand how to answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will able, be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and kinsmen and friends, and some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Whether you knew it or not, and some of us are very aware, this is the age of apps. Apps, you know, on your phone, on your laptop, on your desktop, on your tablet, you know, apps. Apps can tell us the weather, we can order our lunch, some people can even answer their doorbells. But you download an app, for those of you that don't do that, I'll say there's this one called Bear that's a note-taking app. And it's been rated as one of the best apps of 2019. So you download the app and you're all set, or so you thought. But now you're staring at a window on your device with a little tiny checkbox beside which are the words, I have read and accept the terms and conditions for use of this product. Anybody that has done apps, or even when you go do Wi-Fi in other places, you gotta check that box. Now, out of curiosity, you might scroll down and peruse the pages of all that fine print legalese. But you know, we're ready to enjoy our new app. So we mark the I agree option and move on. Well, you're not the only one that does this. These terms and conditions, paragraphs, and privacy policies, on average, are more than 2,500 words long. Well, if you read 250 words a minute, it would take most people at least 10 minutes to read through those conditions. Who does that? Very few. And given the fact that you're likely to use more than 1,400 websites and apps a year, you'd have to devote 25 days annually to reading all these policies. Who does that? No one does that. But you see, there is truly a lot at stake here. Because when you mark, when we mark, I do it, I agree, you may be getting a lot more than you bargained for. Just like when we sign on with Jesus, like I was talking to the children, we're getting more than we bargained for. And one would hope that's a good thing. 
but the going can sometimes be tough. You know, you wonder if the disciples of Jesus really understood what they were signing up for. Did they accept the terms and conditions without actually reading the fine print? Were they so excited about getting to use this new app called Messiah that they threw caution to the winds? Now Peter says, we're in, speaking for himself and his fishermen friends. Or consider the Christians of the church in Thessalonica that Krista read about, to whom Paul is writing in today's epistle reading. Did they know the terms and conditions of the faith that they had embraced. You know, at some point, they must have been get, given an offered an accept or decline option. And they checked the accept box. And now here they were, a religious minority in Thessalonica with, mis, with a misunderstanding about something really, really major. The second coming of Jesus Christ. They thought he was coming soon, like any moment. The return was imminent, they thought. They might not even have time to clear out the breakfast dishes. They accepted the terms and, and, and commitments of the Christian faith, terms and conditions of the Christian faith app, which they assumed promised them deliverance, and a future in a glorious new world, a kingdom of another world completely. You see, Paul's correspondence with the churches of Thessalonica reflected a transition in the life of the developing Christian community. Now, most scholars would agree that Jesus' ministry emerged in a time of apocalyptic excitement. And if you look in the New English Bible, it describes the people on the tiptoe of expectation. Something was about to happen, and it was going to happen very soon. After all, if God's going to intervene in history, there was no better time than the present. After two centuries of fairly benign rule, Rome was becoming increasingly engaged in the lives of the Hebrew population. Roman taxes were now being levied directly, and the occupiers were becoming more interested in the affairs of the temple. Rebellion was in the air, and there was an expectation that something would happen soon, maybe even today. Well, the Essenes, they're the likely authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we call them. They had generated a dramatic war scroll, giving an account of how the final conflict would play out. In this coming battle, the present darkness would be destroyed forever so that the light would prevail. In addition, vivid apocalyptic literature describing this final age was widely circulated. Many Jews believe that God could not allow the present situation to continue much longer. The Lord was about to intervene. And after the death of John, they saw the ministry of Jesus as God's opening act. Well, if we go back in the Gospel accounts and Luke's narrative in the book of Acts, it continues that apocalyptic narrative. After Easter, Jesus' followers anticipated his imminent return, and so there was no need to do any long-term planning, and much that they did was just temporary. Luke describes the communal lifestyle and acts in which everything they owned was held in common, sort of this ad interim lifestyle. But could this last for the long run? And what if Jesus did not make a timely return? What if the church was forced to reorient, reorient its thinking to a longer-term, more sustainable situation? 
Well, that's what Paul's writing about in the epistle lesson that Krista read to you this morning. Jesus has not yet made his triumphant return. The battle that was anticipated in the war scroll has not yet occurred. And the church is forced to deal with this unexpected situation. It has to learn to live in the world of the not yet. But this is not what everyone signed up for. When they checked accept, they expected results. So they had a hard time accepting this change in plans. You see, some members of the community were still living from the labors of others and not contributing to the ongoing common support. As Paul's letter put it, they were living in idleness. Paul instructed the community, anyone willing, unwilling to work should not eat. He's referring to those who actually believed the return of Christ was imminent. These were true believers, and their so-called idleness was a testimony to their fervent belief, however a bit misguided, that Jesus was coming any moment. But Paul is describing them as walking idly or being busybodies. Yes, that word busybodies. You heard her read it. Busybodies is in this passage. And he exhorts them to do their own work quietly and to earn their own living. You see, it appears their offenses might have been particularly institutional ones, lazy, obnoxious, getting in the way of others. It was not just that they ate the bread of others without paying for it. They were actively keeping others from doing the work of the community. So what do we learn from this passage? What's Paul communicating that can help us? Well, you know, whether we accept or decline these terms of conditions that Jesus Christ lays out before us, and whether we fully understand those conditions is what we need to think about. Going back to the early gospel accounts, which describe the call to discipleship, in Matthew, for example, Jesus invites Simon and Andrew with the words, follow me, and the writer reports that immediately they left their nets and followed him. Now, this call probably came without any trigger warnings that we might expect today. There was no statement of the potential side effects of such action, no disclaimer of consequences, and no limitations of liability. There was simply the command, follow me. Perhaps these idlers that Paul's talking about in today's epistle reading had received just such a summons, and they accepted it without looking at the fine print. Perhaps like Simon and Andrew, they left their nets and followed Jesus. That made sense. Since Jesus was bringing in the kingdom of God, it was only a matter of time, a brief one at that, before they would all be in the great light. But there was more to this bargain, wasn't there? Jesus did not simply ask his disciples to follow him. He warned them, saying, If anyone wants to become my disciples, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. You see, there were some consequences to clicking the I Accept app, Jesus app. And those consequences are just frighteningly real. A cross is involved. The social and political cost of identifying with Christ was real. And the injunction to take up your cross, that was no mere metaphor. So for these disciples in Thessalonica, a community under siege, there was no place for those who were unwilling to care 
carry their share of the load. Paul was pressing them in this letter to contribute to the task not only for the sake of others, but for their own. There was work to be done, a prize to be won. You know, in his criticism of those who hang on but do not contribute, he could have been echoing the words of Jesus. In Matthew it says, For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? The same Jesus is the one who said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. You see, there's a truism that says that you can do anything you want if you're willing to pay the price. The problem is, often, we do not know the price. The call in this passage, one that echoes Jesus' call to the Galilean fishermen, is to follow him. Paul's saying it to these people in Thessalonica, and Paul is saying it to us today. Follow him. And we can do this. We can do this, but do we accept the terms and conditions? Do we follow Jesus on our own terms, on the conditions we set? Do we? Are we willing, without knowing exactly what they are, are we willing to accept these terms and conditions of what it means to be a follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ. And if we do, if we accept them, if we know them, are we still going to follow? Are we going to surrender all and not count the cost? Because that's what Christ is calling us to. That's what Christ is saying. I'm not just your Sabbath person. I'm not just the person you call on when you need something. If you are my follower, then you are in it for the whole thing, the long haul all those terms and conditions. That's what Paul is challenging the people of Thessalonica. He's saying, may not be coming back as soon as you think, so you need to get to work. You need to do these things. And he's saying that to us. We need to surrender all and not count the cost. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 730, O Day of God, Draw Nigh.
People of God, as you leave this place, do not grow weary in doing what is right. Sisters and brothers in Christ, as you go forth, share God's vision of a peaceable kingdom. Children of the Holy Spirit, as you return home, live this vision and dream into reality. Amen.